Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to Polar Currency in video number 35. The Missouri defense bond banknotes of the U.S. Civil War era are an interesting enigma. The fascinating question is, is are they an obsolete banknote, a Confederate banknote, or a foreign currency? Missouri was a hotly contested border state populated by both Union and Confederate sympathizers. The state sent armies, generals, and supplies to both sides, maintained dual governments for a period of time, and enduried a bloody neighbor-against-neighbor -neighbor interstate war with the larger national civil war going on. There were a total of three designs issued in early 1862, but it was one particular note that caught my eye for my video, phony as an $8 bill. See the link below in the description that talks about and displays unique and odd banknote denominations. This video idea started out as a short story of one banknote which was never issued. But what's amazing? This single banknote packs over a century of history. The story of the Missouri defense bonds really begins when New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify the U.S. Constitution. Only nine of the 13 colonies were required for acceptance. So thanks, New Hampshire. Way to put us over the top. Why go back to the U.S. Constitution? Because we're dealing with slavery in the Civil War and it makes a difference because the Constitution did not make slavery illegal. It put limitations on slavery, specifically a 20-year limit on the import of persons, ending in 1808. Persons. That's the word the Constitution uses. Not once does the Constitution use the word slave or slavery. One can argue all day long if slavery was constitutional and state rights and all that stuff, but what is clear, it never specifically forbade it. Thus, the question continued to fester, and the delegates of the 1788 Constitutional Convention simply kicked that slavery can right down the road. And that can of slavery landed in 1818, of all places, Massachusetts, technically Maine, where the good people were looking to become a state. Maine statehood sidebar here. Maine originally was a district administered by Massachusetts since 1647, known as Eastern Massachusetts, even though it was North, but I'm not going to go there, making Massachusetts a geographically non-congruous state. By 1818, Maine had a population of around 300,000, far exceeding the statehood requirement of 60. And by 1819, the residents of Eastern Massachusetts had an arm's length list of how the state of Massachusetts was being a wannabe Great Britain. And they were correct. Maybe that's why folks from Massachusetts are called Mass <laughs> Moving on. An agreement was struck and the application was sent on to Washington City for approval. And since we're here, I was curious, how did Maine get its name? So sidebar to the sidebar, of course. The prevailing theory has to do with practical nautical terms. The Maine, or mainland, which served to distinguish the bulk of the state from the numerous islands. Huh. Anyone else think it would have something more to it? End of sidebars. Getting back to Missouri, as it happens, Missouri also had been looking to becoming a state since before 1817, but had to be put on hold. Congress had to keep the balance of free state versus slave states. Maine's application offered the possibility of a compromise. To maintain the balance, the two requests for statehood would be packaged together Kind of a buy one slave and get one free? Get it? All right, all right. Congress did the simple math, amazing that they could do that, and admitted Maine to the Union in 1820 and Missouri in 1821. This was part of the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that tried with futility to address growing sectional tensions over the issue of slavery. By passing the law signed by President James Monroe, the U.S. Congress kept the balance. The Compromise also banned slavery from the remaining Louisiana Purchase lands located north of the southern border of Missouri. Fast forward to the late 1850s and Missouri's geographic position in the center of the continent and at the rural edge of the American frontier ensured that it remained a divisive region for competing northern and southern ideologies in the years preceding the Civil War. 
When the war started in 1861, it became unmistakable that control of the Mississippi River and the economic hub of St. Louis would make Missouri a very strategic area in the western Mississippi theater of war. The war in Missouri was continuous between 1861 and 1865, with more than 1,200 distinct engagements across the entire state. By the end of the war in 1865, nearly 110,000 Missourians had served in the Union Army and at least 40,000 in the Confederate. All right, let's get to the Missouri defense bonds origination story. In 1860, Missouri elected pro-slavery Claiborne Fox Jackson as their 15th governor. With the outbreak of war in 1861, Jackson became the leader of pro-slavery supporters that tried to get Missouri to secede from the Union and join the Confederate States of America. In his inaugural speech in January of 1861, Jackson declared that Missouri's destiny lay with the southern states, and he warned that Missouri would secede if the North attempted to coerce the South. Two months later, Governor Jackson forced the Missouri legislature to hold a convention in St. Louis and take a vote of whether or not Missouri would remain with the Union. Unfortunately for Governor Jackson and his southern sympathizers, most of the Missouri legislators were pro-Union, and they announced that there was no adequate cause to impel Missouri to dissolve her connection with the Federal Union. So, no vote was taken. President Lincoln's call for 75,000 volunteers in April of 1861, following the surrender of Fort Sumter, was the catalyst that split Missouri. In reaction to Lincoln's call to arms, Jackson created the Missouri State Guard, calling for 50,000 volunteers to defend Missouri against Union invasion. In May, Jackson sent half of the State Guard to train outside of St. Louis, while the other half remained in Jefferson City, the capital of Missouri. The camp's proximity to the federal arsenal in St. Louis caused Union concerns that the militia would capture the arsenal's 36,000 arms. The camp was named Camp Jackson in honor of Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson, of course. Union forces did react and marched on the pro-secession state guard camp, leading to a riot in which 28 were killed. On June 11, 1861, Jackson met with the commanding Union general hoping to extend a truce, but was refused. Union forces then marched on Jefferson City, resulting in Jackson and other pro-Confederate officials fleeing to Boonville, Missouri. Union forces then routed Governor Jackson and the rest of the Confederate Missouri State Guard at the Battle of Boonville, forcing them into the southwestern corner of the state to regroup. In mid-July, Jackson traveled to Richmond, Virginia to consult with Jefferson Davis, the President of the Confederate States of America. On his return, he learned that the Missouri State Legislature had deposed him as governor, declaring the office vacant, and voted to remain in the Union. Ignoring the declaration and the vote, Jackson declared Missouri a free republic and dissolved all ties with the Union on August 5, 1861. In November, Jackson summoned the old state pro-secessionist assembly to meet in Neosho, Missouri. Less than a quorum of either house was able to attend, but uh, details, details. Who needs a majority? Of course, a formal ordinance of secession was still passed, and they appointed senators and representatives to the Confederacy. On November 28, 1861, Missouri was admitted to the Confederacy. After the Battle of Pea Ridge, Governor Jackson, along with the Southern sympathizers of the state government, were again forced further south into Arkansas. The secessionist government eventually established their new capital in Marshall, Texas in late 1863, thereafter not having any real substantial effect on Missouri. Governor Jackson didn't have long to see the fruits of his pro-slavery labor, dying of cancer on December 6, 1862. It's amazing what you come across sidebar. One of the references that I used for the Missouri defense bonds was the book Confederate and Southern States Currency by Grover Cleveland Criswell Jr. Well, with that name and seeing a picture of Criswell, I had to find out what his deal was. Criswell was quite the self-promoter. He was a politician, collector, currency scholar, and author of several books. Criswell served as a lieutenant in the Air Force from 1955 to 1957, was the mayor of St. Petersburg, Florida at age 25, met Senator John F. Kennedy on the presidential campaign trail in 1960, 
appeared on the TV shows What's My Line, The Today Show, and To Tell the Truth in 1961. As we discover which one of these gentlemen is the real richest man in the world in Confederate money. So will a real Grover C. Criswell please stand up? He owned his own money museum in St. Petersburg, where an actor in full Confederate military dress greeted you at the entrance. It closed after thieves cut a hole in the roof and stole 298,000 worth of coins and paper money, which is over three million today. Criswell also launched the Banknote Reporter in 1972 and served as its publisher for four years. Criswell was a big man, by reports over 300 pounds, and in later years grew a goatee and wore a Colonel Sanders string tie calling himself the richest man in the world in Confederate money. He served on the ANA Board of Governors for 22 years. He even had a silver bar minted with his likeness in 1977. I mean, how many numismatists can say that? He was a familiar figure at coin shows and auctions and through his mail order collector business where he had taken the name Colonel Griswold. According to Pierre Frick, a highly respected expert on Confederate and obsolete currency himself and also an award-winning author, he stated in a 2021 St. Pete Catalyst article, I stand on the shoulders of giants, including his. Criswell was a significant leader, a great marketer and promoter. Criswell was kind of an icon for paper currency. End of sidebar. All right, all right, back to the main story, but that was a great sidebar rabbit hole. After passing the Act of Secession, the exiled Governor Jackson and the Confederate Missouri Legislature in Neosho, Missouri, also voted $10 million for defense and authorized the issuance of defense bonds for that amount. 10 million based on what was a question that wasn't asked. It's worth noting that the Union government of Missouri also issued Union military bonds, which were honored, albeit 10 years later. Obviously, after the South lost the war, the Missouri defense bonds were worthless. The first issuance of Missouri pro-Southern currency was dated January 1st, 1862, and came in denominations of 1, 2, 3, 5, 10 and $20 notes and were univace in design. They're not specifically identified as bonds, but all denominations state three years after date. What's odd about the first series is that the one, two, and three had a completely different design than the five, 10, and 20. They also had different obligations with the one, two, and three just stating, will pay bearer X amount of dollars. The larger denomination stated will pay bearer X amount of dollars with 10% interest, possibly the reason for the difference of design, which in my opinion would make it a fourth issue. The notes were engraved and printed by Alexander Malice of New Orleans. As for the artistic merit of the first series, they're rather unsophisticated. Okay, I just can't be nice here. Let's face it, they're super juvenile and some of the worst obsolete banknotes that I've seen. Sorry, but that's just the truth. The second issue from the Confederate State of Missouri is the note that I have and the foundation of this video, the odd $4.50 denomination created by the Act of November 5th, 1861, and is the more well-known Missouri defense bond. And yep, that's spelled Anglican style with a C, not an S. These were printed in sheets of one and three and four and 450 denominations. These do not state that interest will be paid and the issuance date is blank to be completed along with the serial number by hand when issued. The large vignette to the right depicts the allegorical figures representing commerce, prosperity, and navigation, and this was adapted from Danforth, Bald & Company's 1861 T-17 $20 Confederate bill. The center has a large red ornate denomination underprint similar to the late 1870s $1 legal tender note. It's a bit hard to make out, but you can see the four and a half using an actual fraction for the denomination. The lower left has the state seal of Missouri, which bears the very ironically used Patrick Henry quote of, United we stand, divided we fall. 
In the upper left is the large scalloped 450 using a decimal denomination for, you know, $4.50. The defense bond is uniface and has no printing on the reverse. It's believed that all of the second issue notes are all remainders and were never issued, possibly because Jackson and the rest of the Missouri Confederate sympathizer politicians were too busy hightailing it out of the state. Colonel Griswold's book does state, quote, although it is generally supposed that these notes exist unsigned only, several signed pieces have been confirmed. Such pieces, if genuinely signed, are very rare. Collectors should be aware of fake signatures, end quote. So it appears that a $4.50 note never circulated, but certainly it's the oddest denomination that I have in my collection. The third issue of Missouri's Confederate government are the requisitions for Missouri defense bond notes dated just 18 blank, not even a legislative date. These were printed in denominations of 20, 50, and 100. These notes are beautifully engraved and are unique for obsolete and or Confederate notes that the reverse also was printed. Interestingly, these items were designed to be provided for payment to volunteer soldiers serving in the Missouri State Guard. According to the obligation text, which, in a very unusual way, is part of the banknotes border and reads, this requisition, when presented with others, of the same denomination to the amount of $100 to the fund commissioners will be funded in Missouri defense bonds for that sum payable, three years after date and bearing interest at the rate of 10% per annum payable semi-annually. So if I'm understanding this, you get paid with these requisition notes, but you have to accumulate $100 of the same denomination, then turn them over to receive Missouri defense bonds to then get some sort of payment of money three years later? I guess the Missouri State Guard really had some faith. These notes were engraved and printed by Keating and Ball of Columbia, South Carolina, who also produced the famous T-64 $500 banknote with Stonewall Jackson. Keating and Ball were the sole engravers of all printing plates for the Confederacy and printed massive amounts of paper currency along with several other printers. To me, it's fascinating to see how paper currency intertwines with and reflects history, especially during pivotal times, such as the U.S. Civil War. So, what's my opinion as to what are Missouri defense bonds? An obsolete banknote, a Confederate banknote, foreign currency? Well, they weren't issued by a bank, so not an obsolete. The Confederacy was never recognized by another nation, so not foreign currency. The second series with the 450 note was issued before Missouri was admitted to the Confederacy, so those are simply banknotes issued by an individual state in rebellion. A fourth option. The first and second series were issued after Missouri was granted Confederate statehood, so in my humble opinion, they are Confederate banknotes. It is interesting that the Heritage Auction website lists them as obsolete. Now, that makes everything clear as mud for you. You have to love paper currency. Well, that's it for video number 35. Special thanks to the Society of Paper Money Collectors, their May-June 2002 article, Missouri's Confederate Government Rises Again by Bob Cochran. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I appreciate your time. If you like what you see, please hit the thumbs up button. Feel free to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you in two weeks and thanks for checking in.